I've been a Christian my whole life, uh, since I was about five years old. Um, I, I've, I've really de- I dedicated my life to the Lord. But Christianity and, and having faith is not a one-shot. It's not you become a Christian and all of a sudden you get wings and a halo. Um, it is a journey of learning how to, how to be human, how to make mistakes, how to not be fully refined. And I, I think the thing that wasn't told to me when I became a Christian is that this refining process is going to be an incredibly difficult, but at the same time, really fun and enjoyable. And, and so I think growing up in youth group, growing up in churches, and, and even moving, uh, we moved from California to Texas, it was a lot of this refining, refining fire, this, this iron sharpening iron type of thing. And I, I just remember thinking, even at a point in growing up in a very Christian household, you know, I wonder what it's going to be like when I'm on my own, when I go to college and I can choose what my faith is. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a very fearful person. I'm a, uh, 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 so fearful that even when I go to college, I knew I had to go to church. Like I, I, was, I didn't even skip a single Sunday. Um, even, even just to kind of feel what a, a free Sunday was like, I was like, no, if I skip a Sunday, uh, I think God will know. And so I got to find a church. And so I remember uh, I went to church, and that Sunday, uh, that very first Sunday, I went with a friend who was a little older and had a car. He, he brought me to church. And that Sunday was a Sunday I actually met my wife for the first time. So for those of you that uh, are thinking about skipping Sunday, you never know, especially you singles. You never know when you're going to meet your future spouse. Uh, and I remember meeting my wife, and I, I, I didn't like her, but we, we talked, and, and, and we, we, just, we just had that moment of talking, and she's like, you talk too much, I can't handle you. And I was like, well, it was, it was, it was nice meeting you. But something really cool happened, and again, it's not because my wife was there, but something really cool happened was um, someone in the congregation grabbed my arm and was like, hey, we're going to lunch. So we didn't, we didn't have a kitchen, um, or at least we, we, our kitchen wasn't really u- utilized to feed people after Sundays. Everyone just left straight from the sanctuary and went to go eat. And, and we would just go to the different restaurants and, and go to different places. And being a freshman, or not even a freshman, this was before school even started, um, someone kind of just grabbing me and was like, basically told me, you're mine. And I was like, this is so weird. What kind of church am I going to? But he's like, uh, basically this guy, um, and I m- I'll always remember his name. It was, it was, his name was Mike Yim. And he took me, he says, is your, your, you're mine today. And I, I had no idea what that meant. Uh, but he, he took me in his car and we drove to, I think it was a pho restaurant. And um, basically he's like, just talking to me, getting to know me, and I, I was like, this is, this is cool. Like, it felt really good because um, having someone that I never knew, like, introduce themselves to me and, like, bring me, and, and basically, he sat me down, and we ate lunch, and he's like, um, I'm going to pay for your meal today. And I was like, I was like, that's awesome. That's great. But, but what Mike did was really interesting, and, and he was, like, the leader at the church. He was a senior at the time, um, but he was, like, the leader. And I remember at, as we're in the pho restaurant, and we had a lot of college kids in the room, he went to every upperclassman, and he's like, you're paying for this person. And, and he would go to every upperclassman. He goes, is that your freshman? Okay, that's your freshman. And he would go around, and he would pair up all, all the seniors with the freshmen, all the upperclassmen with the underclassmen, and he would make sure that these upperclassmen would buy the food for these underclassmen. And I was like, this church is crazy. This is awesome. Um, because I remember they, they, they took us, like, grocery shopping. They took us out to eat. And it wasn't just that first Sunday. What I was so shocked and surprised with was that it was every Sunday for the whole first semester that, that a different senior would come up to me and they would say, you're my freshman for this week and I'm going to buy you your meal. I'm going to buy you your lunch. And I was like, aren't you guys poor? And they would be like, yeah, we're super poor. But they would basically be saying, when you're a senior, you got to do this to the freshman when you're a senior. Because from their understanding, this is what church was. It was, you go to church you listen, you, you sing the songs, and, and you praise, but the service doesn't end there. The service actually is just motivation to go find that freshman, to go find that person and say, today, I'm going to buy you your meal. I'm going, to, I'm going to be the one just to sit with you and eat with you. And, and we weren't, they weren't allowed to double up. It wasn't like, you know, okay, Jeremy, I, I bought your meal last week, so I'm going to buy your meal this week, and the week after, and the week after that. It was a new person every week. And, and it was funny because I, uh, I, I love college. I'm so nostalgic about college, and I realize a lot of it is because 
kind of the first month and first two months, the first semester of college, I felt like I knew all of these older people at school, and I would see them, you know, and, and being a freshman, I, I felt so young, I felt so little, and I, and I would walk into the library, and you would have these, these really old people, and they weren't old, I mean, they were seniors in college, they were young too, but these old people would be in the library, and they would be like, hey, come sit with us, i am like, oh my gosh, <laughs> and I would sit with them, and I would be like so excited, they would invite me over to their house. They would drive me to different places, and, and, and I would hang out with them, and I felt so loved. And something interesting happened. Over, over the years, as we, became, as we became the upperclassmen, a rule was made. And I was very confused. I'm a passionate person. So when I'm confused, I, I, I express it in passion. But there was a rule that was made by the leadership of, of the, the ministry, that no longer were seniors going to buy meals for freshmen. And, and, the, and the reason was, is the seniors were poor. And they didn't have that much money to buy meals to the freshmen. And, and I had sympathy, absolutely. I, I had sympathy for, for the circumstances of these people. But for me, I was like, but they got a free meal when they were freshmen. It's our turn to, to give back. It's our turn to sacrifice a little bit. And I remember there was a little bit of talk uh, amongst the people. And what ended up happening was because leadership changed this, it, the, the people that were still firm that I'm going to buy meals for the freshmen still bought meals for the freshmen. But something was born out of this that was very, in my opinion, unhealthy. Because it was no longer this united vision of, of the ministry. And it wasn't even a big vision. The, the vision was just find a freshman and buy them a meal. I'm sorry, that's probably the smallest vision you can have. But because this vision was not being fulfilled, what ended up happening was the seniors, the upperclassmen who wanted to buy meals for freshmen, began to choose which freshmen they would buy meals for. Because it's not a rule. It's just what I want to do. Now it's not Mike Yim telling me, go and buy and go and find a different freshman every Sunday. It was just, hey, when I was a freshman, a senior bought me a meal, so I'm going to find the freshmen that I like, the, the young ones that I find fun to hang out with. I'm not going to buy that loner in the corner, that emo person in the corner, a meal. I'm going to go find, you know, the cool guys. I'm going to find the guys that can, can be in my group. And yeah, they're freshmen, but you know what? I'm going to buy their meal. I'm going to be their older brother. I'm going to watch over them. I'm going to take care of them. I don't need to go out and reach out to people I don't know. And that's kind of what happened. As soon you began to see people just breaking off into their various cliques, breaking off into their various groups. And I remember just thinking like, man, this wasn't what... The rule was meant for. The rule wasn't made to bur be a burden on those serving. And the rule wasn't meant to, to make the freshmen feel like, oh yeah, you have to buy me lunch. And I remember that was a problem. When we knew that, that they would buy our lunches, we would kind of go, hey, we should go to these nicer restaurants. We should go to these other places because they're going to buy us food or, or we'll, we'll do these things. The rule wasn't meant to be abused. The rule was actually supposed to curb our human tendency. And our human tendency, like what we've been talking about, is natural. Yes, it's very natural. But sometimes it's about learning how to overcome and discipline and train the natural to unlock the supernatural. Is that when we learn how to be disciplined and we learn how to go against our fleshly desires, we unlock God's true intent on how life is meant to be. Simply today, I'm talking about popularity. I'm talking about partiality. I'm talking about cliques. I'm talking about personal preference. And all these things are very natural. Absolutely are these, like even when you're drawn, you're attracted to someone, it's very natural. You should. You should be drawn to people and have those close friend groups. And I am not trying for you to break those friend groups, but you have to recognize being attracted to someone is natural. And there is a way to discipline. There is a way to be refined, to follow the Lord. Because it is not simply, 
It is not simply about finding people that are like yourself. That today we are talking about evangelism. Today we are talking about spreading God's word. And more importantly, spreading the love of the word to everyone, to all nations, to all people. And for some of us, you're stuck in a spiritual rut. You are stuck in a spiritual neutral because you're afraid to shift into this new way of thinking that's going to hurt a little bit, that's going to be uncomfortable because it forces you to be with people that you would never find yourself with. Today, the passage comes from James chapter 2, starting from verse 1. It's on the screen behind me, but if you do have a Bible, I, I do recommend you either open your apps or you open up, up the book so you can read and make sure that I'm not saying something that's not in your Bible. But let me start from verse 1. It says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you, sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you, stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judge, judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into courts? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are, who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without, mer without mercy to one who has, shown mer who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I've been mulling over this this week, and I, I realized something. I, I've been kind of reading it wrong, and I think this is a, a recommendation for you as well when you have your devotions and you go into the Word and read it over and over and over again. I, I think the way I've, I've read this has always been about wealth and money. It's always been like, okay, you know what? We shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't show favor to the people that are rich. So church needs to be a place where no matter what your socioeconomic status, that you feel welcome. No matter what, what your income is, um, no matter how much you make, no matter what your occupation is, is that we're all equal here, and, and that's, that's how it's going to be. And that's, that's great. I think that's a great reading and interpretation of this. But I think that's the shallowest way to, to listen to this passage. Because I think that's just a simple, easy way to lack depth in a community, to lack what God really wants from us when he talks about not being partial I think he's using the example of a rich man and a poor man because it's so clear and it's so obvious. But I think in our culture, it's a little bit different. Because in our culture, and not to make light of it, but in our culture, it's, it's kind of um, rude to talk about income. It's, talk, it's kind of rude to, um, to find out how much someone makes. And, and, and even when someone comes, in our culture you don't know how much debt they're in. We don't, we don't know. I mean, for all I know, you all look beautiful today. You all look great. But for all I know, the one wearing the, the most expensive clothing here today could be the one most in credit card debt. So I, I, what, I, what I mean to say is, as I read this, 
I think just culturally, the way James is talking about it is back in the day, they didn't have these bank accounts like we do that you could hide all of your money and you could have all these big storehouses. And, and, and basically, people knew if you were rich and people knew if you were poor. They, it, this was an outward expression that they were able to distinguish. And so when someone came in and they probably smelled different, I, I, I want you to know, if you were poor, you were probably working in the field and you probably came into this small room. And again, the size of the sanctuary is probably like 10 times the size of a normal church service back when James wrote this. And imagine a poor person walking in, and it's not just that they're poor, it's that they smell really bad because they can't afford to go take a bath. Taking a bath was probably a a once-in-a-season type of thing, maybe once a month if they were lucky. But the rich people, they were the ones that were able to wash themselves and have perfume put over their heads. They were able to be clean from dirt. <laughs> and so again, the difference from our, our context and the context in, tor- in terms of historically is probably way more drastic. And I, I'm sure these communities that James is talking to is that when these dirty people came in, and I, I'm not I'm trying to make that offensive, I, I'm saying they were literally dirty people. These dirty people came in, the reaction of the community was, all right, you need to stand back there. You need to go to the back. Or you need to sit at the feet of everyone else. You're a distraction. And for the rich person, what it, what, for, the, for the people, and it's not, again, I'm not trying to say it's because they're rich, but they probably just smelled better. They probably wore better clothes. They probably looked better. They were probably better slept, like meaning that they, they had more rest because they weren't out in the fields all day. They were, they were in luxury. Oh, sit here. Sit next to me. You're beautiful. You're pretty. I like how you smell. And it's interesting, like, um, even, even the way that it's talked about is that if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes in, I think churches nowadays do it a little bit different, is that it's the wedding ring. Um, and, and I think our church had this problem uh, when I first came, but I think it's, it's less of a problem now. But sometimes what ends up happening is, is oh, where's your wife? Oh, I'm single. Oh, oh okay. You can sit with the young adults over there. <laughs> You know, oh, 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 do you have kids? Oh, no kids? Okay, well, uh, I, I, I'll take care of my kids. And what ends up happening is in these moments, in these groups, it's a natural response. And again, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty for the natural. It's that we have to have an understanding that the natural many times is a distortion of how God intended things to be. The natural is not that it's bad inherently, but it's a twisted version of what God wanted. And what James goes in to say, he says, don't you know that it's these poor people, it's these stinky people, it's these dirty people, the ones that you are ostracizing, that they are rich in faith. And what I love about this is not this oversweeping thing saying in order for you to be faithful or for you to have a relationship with Christ is that you have to be poor, is that there's an understanding that these poor people have been living lives under oppression, that these poor people have been living lives where everyone looks down on them. And when everyone looks down on you, your sensitivity to a Savior is much higher is that when you are the oppressed groups, when you are the marginalized group, when you are always being chosen last, your sensitivity to the Spirit is at an all-time high. God does not use the proud, but He uses the humble. And so the poor people that James is talking about, he's explaining to the church, do you not understand that this is the ripest soil that you could possibly harvest in. And for whatever reason, you're choosing to favor the hard soil, the granite, the hard hearts, the ones who are not willing to hear from the Spirit, the ones who are going to take you to court, the ones who are going to persecute you. For whatever reason, you are showing partiality to these rich people, but these rich people, these People who think that they made their own success, who think that they're good, who think that God is blessing them. You're showing them the best seats when really 
you should be giving the best of your resources to the marginalized, to the ones hurting. Because guess what? Those are the ones that are actually going to build the kingdom of God. The Bible has a lot of talk about wealth. And I think, I think we have to wrap our heads around it. Is that it's not a call for you to empty your bank account and do that. But guess what? That might be the call that God is telling you so that you can learn the heart of a poor person. Your salvation is not found in how good you look. Your salvation is not found in how good your hair is. Your salvation is not found in the kind of car you drive or the kind of home you live in. Your salvation is found in only Jesus. And the reason why James is bringing out this level of partiality is because he's saying the poor people understand the gospel message. They understand that there is nothing in this world that can save them from themselves, that can save them from their sin. But when they come to church, even though the message may be gospel, even though the message may the weak and the weary come and find shelter in the Lord, what they feel from the congregation is, okay, I hear from the pastor, I need Jesus, and that's all I need. But what I feel from the congregation is I need to look better. I need to look strong. I need to look good. I need to look wealthy. I need to look successful. Because when I am successful, that's when they'll embrace me. When things go well, that's when they'll come over to my house and have a party. That when, that when I find, when I find my identity, then I will be accepted into this community. I'm sorry, we need to flip that around. We need to be welcoming to the people that don't have an identity so that we can help them find their identity in Christ. Our church is not interested in people coming in knowing who they are. Our church is interested in coming in people coming to find who we are in Christ, who we are in our Lord. If you've come today thinking you know who you are, you know where you stand. You know what your blessings are and, and where your foundation is. You're wrong. You're wrong. Because knowing that your foundation is in, is in Christ is a daily thing. It's a daily. It's a daily submission of taking up your cross and following him. Even if, you're a, even if you're doing high spiritually, even if you're good and you're on fire, I still recommend that you spend some time on your knees searching for Jesus because it's the times in which we are confident and we think we are rich that we are truly poor. And it's in those moments we recognize we are poor that we are able to find rest, restoration in the Lord. This is a call to you, church, to not show partiality. That regardless of who walks into our sanctuary, whoever comes and joins us in fellowship, that we would embrace them with a full heart. That we would embrace them as if we are embracing Christ. And again, this is not for, you, for me to say that there aren't going to be people you are naturally attracted to. Of course. You're going to have your friends. You're going to have your close groups. That's great. But what I say to you is use that as leverage. Use that attraction with people to bring along this new form of evangelism. Use your groups. Use your influence. Use your popularity to search out for those who are not being sought after. That you would be the one to stand firm for those that feel lonely. That those that feel that they have no friends. When I see my generation, when I see young people, I know that there are people that look like they're doing very well. But I know at the very same time, there's a large, a large group that feel that they have no friends, that feel that they are very alone. And it's funny because I even talk to some of the popular people. Some of the people that they look really good. And guess what? They feel so alone too. 
And this is the call and the cry that I'm beginning to hear out, is that the world has told you a lie, is that if you look rich, you're going to be liked and you're going to be accepted and you're going to be loved. I'm sorry, the gospel message tells something very different, is that if you are poor and if you are not put together, the arms of Christ are waiting for you. That if you are not perfect, that if you are broken, if things are going wrong, the church is wanting to give you the best seat in the house. That if things Things aren't going perfect in your life that we can say, hey, come, sit here, be here. This is a great place to sit. And you know what? The people that, if you think you are doing really well, if life is going grand, you should be willing to sit at the feet. You should be willing to sit at the back, not as punishment, not as a rule. This is not legalism. This is liberty. That we do it because we know if you're sitting here and life is going grand, it's going great, that's wonderful. So use that in a way that can help the poor because their hearts are ready to receive Jesus. Their hearts are ready to accept a Savior. And let me tell you, there is no greater joy than seeing someone give their life to Christ. And some of you are so poor because you've never witnessed that. And I want to see you be rich. And let me tell you, this can happen with you simply buying someone a meal. This can happen simply with you making that phone call to someone that you noticed. Hey, they were sitting all alone. Or they looked down. I wonder what's wrong. And I want our community to be a place, a safe place, where that kind of partiality is viewed as a sin. Where that kind of favoritism is viewed as a sin. James goes as far as to explain, do you not understand that this is a part of God's law? That the same person who said, love your neighbor as yourself, said, do not commit murder and do not commit adultery. And just because you commit adultery, but you haven't committed, committed murder, that you've broken the whole law. So the whole idea is this. It's not to say that murder is good. It's not to say that adultery is good. It's not even to say, oh, Jesus died for me, and because Jesus died for me, I'm cleansed of all my sins, past, present, and future, and so therefore I can go and commit adultery. Therefore, I can go and commit murder. I'm sorry, it's not an excuse. What it is, is that it's a call to discipline. Naturally, you want to commit murder. You naturally, you hate people. Naturally, you want to go out and you want to hurt those who have hurt you. But the way that God has taught us is that you are covered by his blood. And therefore, be free to forgive. Naturally, we are lustful. Naturally, we want to feed those lustful desires. And so we, we, want, we want to go and we want to have affairs and, and commit adultery and do all these things. And it's very natural. But because you are covered by the blood of Christ, you're free to be faithful, to be pure, to show chastity. And in the same way, when it comes to loving your neighbor as yourself, it is not a condemnation to hell. It is a call to heaven, saying it's very hard to love your neighbor as yourself. It's a very simple rule, and you're going to make mistakes. And yes, you are covered in the blood of Jesus, and all the mistakes you've made can be forgiven and are forgiven, but it doesn't mean to stop trying. The title of the sermon is Partial Credit, and I realize, I realize why, I, I mean, not, I realize why we have a lot of problems. It's because a lot of you are living the Christian life for partial credit. You know, you know deep down that there's no way that you're going to be like Jesus. There's no way you're even going to be a fourth of Jesus, a tenth of Jesus, a hundredth of Jesus. And so you know what? You're going to try your best, and you know Jesus is there, but you're going to do your best, and on all the areas that you're going to mess up, you're just kind of like, I'm never going to be good enough and so I'll just go for the, you know, I'll just go for the partial credit. I'll just go for the lowest grade that I can. You already got 100%. I, I've used this analogy before. But as your pastor, I want to tell you, if you believe in Jesus, your grade before God 
because Jesus did the work for you. Because in this group project of being a human, because Jesus did it for you, all you got to do is write your name on his paper. All you got to do is is add your name to what Jesus has already done, and you're going to get the grade that your Savior gets. And that's a perfect hundred. But guess what? You still got to learn the material too. Guess what? The whole idea of you getting that 100% on this thing called life is not just so that you can live life going, well, thanks, Jesus, now I can live however I want. The point of taking this class, the point of living life is not just so that Jesus does all the work and he is is my savior. Jesus, take the wheel. I don't got to do anything. Yes, you are saved. Yes, your identity is firmly in Christ. But guess what? Now Jesus is like, hey, you got the A, so stop stressing out so much. Stop being so dang competitive with one another. Stop trying to be someone that you're not. Stop trying to act like you're going to get a better grade than the person sitting next to you. You all got the same grade. But now, let's learn the material. Now, come to lectures. Come to the classrooms, do the readings, do the assignments, do the homework, knowing that you are no longer under the law of transgressions, where you are going to be marked and critiqued in every single way. Now you are under the law of liberty, where you can do this at your own pace. There's a difference between reading a book for enjoyment and reading a book for a class. For many of you, my goal as your pastor is for you to read the Bible, to read scripture for enjoyment. Not because you are required to. Not because God is going to be up in heaven saying, oh, I'm so proud you read your Bible today. No, but instead, God looks at you the way that he looks at Christ. Don't forget that. What makes us a Christian is not because you do such a good job. It's because the blood of Christ covers you. So when God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit observe you, you are not broken. You are not, you are not tainted by sin. You are as beautiful as Jesus. And so now we have the freedom to enjoy. When we come to church... When we come to church, we forget. I forget. When I come to church, I forget my identity. I forget why I'm doing this. I forget. I forget a lot. But it all comes back to the fact that it's not about me. It's not about how good I am, how closely I adhere to the word, how good my preaching is, how good my singing is. None of that matters. Because what matters is Jesus came, he died, and he rose again. And church, I I, I, want to be real honest with you. And I I want to say this as as long as I need to. I'm a broken man. I'm an imperfect person. I will make mistakes. I have made mistakes. I will continue to make mistakes. I will never be, I will never be what you need me to be. And that's what, not what church is about. I can never be what you need me to be. But Christ will always be what you need him to be. Christ will always be there for you. Because one day I will die. And how relieving that will be. But one day I will die. And that won't impact your faith. What impacts your faith is knowing that in life or death, that we are loved and marked by a Savior. So stop living your life for partial credit. Y'all got a hundreds. You have an A, A plus. You can get an A plus plus for those of you that really need that. And so now as a church that has been marked by the work of Christ. Go out and love others as if they are marked by the love of Christ. That even your worst enemy, they've been given an A++ by the Lord. So in whatever way, would you love them that way?
Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day, and I pray, Lord, that we would not be a church of partiality, that we would be searching out for the oppressed, that we would be searching out for the marginalized. Father, I pray that as we even move locations and go to the city of Aurora, where there are a lot of marginalized groups, that our church would have a heart to reach out to these refugees, to reach out to these people and not look down on them because of their income, not look down on them because they do things differently, but we would see them as fertile soil for your word and fertile soil for the gospel message that they would be made free and the kingdom of God would be built. Lord, I pray that you would be with us. I pray you would be with me. God, as the storms, they may come, that we would cling on to you and you alone. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for what you are doing to us, with us, through us. Father, I pray that in all these things, Lord, we would give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. How good you are to us. How undeserved we are for your love. And so, Father, I pray that as we go in our weeks, that we would not have the sin of partiality, but instead that we would know we are wholly covered by your blood, and therefore we should love everyone the way that you love us. So give us this heart this week. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.